Okay, we're going to do a little Kistler dual force plates with uh, S2M power. Uh, a little description of what these plates will do. For starters, what makes them different is their individual force plates, one under each foot that is only measuring what the individual foot is doing. Uh, the software can combine these forces during the golf swing and put them in these graphs. So we're going to go over these graphs real quick. When you play the video, you'll see it's a, it's a linear graph that goes from left to right. And I've marked here, I don't call it a dress anymore, I call it tape back, top of the swing, and impact. So here's your three markers. So the reason I call it take back is because truthfully the forces start before the club even starts moving back. So at this point for instance this is when the club actually first starts moving back we're already creating all these forces and torques in the ground before the club even moves. So um, this is Taylor Moore who plays on the Corn Ferry Tour, the longest driver out there at 160 pounds. He hits the ball over 330 yards on average, so he's amazingly long and powerful. Uh, what we're going to do is look at these forces that he creates and uh, tell you where some of our observations are. So the first is the lateral force. As you know, that's towards and away from the target uh, with each individual foot. On the graphs, the red lines are the trail foot or the right foot in his condition. And then the blue line is the lead foot. And then the brown line is the combined. So you can see when that brown line gets to zero that the trail foot's pushing as much in one direction and the lead foot is pushing exactly the same amount in the opposite direction. So that would always net to a zero but you're going to see the combined as we start back in the in the backswing his maximum lateral move away from the ball his force is right there so that's the maximum force away from the ball and right here we denote this because this is when he already is changing force going away from the target back towards the target and what's interesting to note here is that the lead foot is really what's the big difference in why this force changes in one direction to the other. The trail foot in red is increasing slightly, but it's been pushing the whole time. The difference is the lead foot starts, as I call, changing its mind push you from pushing you away from the target, and it's soon going to be start pulling you towards the target. So from here on, that blue line being above zero is what's helping him pull himself towards the target. Um, and you can see when he reaches maximum lateral force right here, he's actually pulling equally with the trail and the lead leg. So it's just not the trail leg pushing. Very interesting and stuff you can't get from the other systems where the force is coming from. So he goes to maximum lateral force of 23.5 and these are in percentages of his total body mass. So if he weighs 200 pounds, 47% of, he's pushing 47 pounds of which 11.91 are from the trail foot, 11.59 are from the lead foot. So that's how this is calculated. And what I started observing is that not only how much um, are these peaks, in other words, their magnitude, but then when they happen. And you can see he reaches peak lateral not long after the top of his swing. So there's the top, there's peak lateral. So the peak lateral and the top are very, very close to each other. Um, and, you know, the, the, the lateral for most players is slightly after the top, and I mean very slightly. And then what you'll see is a quick reversal of that lateral towards the target. And you can see that brown line going way, way, way down all the way to here. So now he's negative 23% of his body weight pushing away from the target, of which most of it is coming from his lead. 
So his lead leg is pushing back. His trail foot is still pushing forward. And, you know, the ground reaction force is moving his body, actually stopping it from going as much forward. So that's part of the, I call it unloading the jackknife, is how quick can we get these maximum forces in one direction to quickly be reversed exactly in the other direction. To me, that's the thing that I see that creates the most speed. You're going to see that both in the torque numbers and in the vertical numbers. Okay, the second, the second graph here is in the X axis, and this is the anterior posterior force of the trail and lead foot. So your feet are moving forward and backward um, horizontally on the ground. This is these forces. Again, the trail foot is in red, the lead foot is in blue. I don't look at the combined very often because to be honest with you, these, these two forces on the opposite side of the center of mass, so they're really added together instead of canceling each other out. So when one's positive and one's negative, it's helping our rotational abilities. So let's go back to address again and then take back. So basically here's address. So when, you know, that's, that's what I would call address. Take back is when the club actually starts moving. So for instance, at this moment in time, he's got a little bit of anterior posterior going on even when the club starts. So the trail foot is pushing forward toward the ball, which creates a negative ground reaction force, which actually moves the right hip backwards. And then the, uh, his lead foot is doing the same thing. So it, it, it's a little bit of in the same direction. Uh, as we go back, here's the maximum rotational in the backswing where the feet are pushing in the opposite direction. So again, the lead foot is pushing positive which means it's pushing back towards that wall and then the trail foot is pushing the most it's going to push in the backswing towards the ball and you're going to see their reverse so these anterior posterior forces are also what determines this vertical torque now the vertical torque so around the z-axis the vertical axis this is the uh, golfer's mass and the amount of torque that he's putting in the golf swing to create rotation. So you can see maximum away from the ball torque is right there in the brown. And then the uh, its contrib main contributor is this anterior posterior force of the feet. So then again, they quickly reverse. So right here is when the feet start changing direction. And when they start changing direction, in other words, now the lead foot starting to push towards the ball and the trail foot starting to push towards the wall, um, that's when this vertical torque starts kicking in. And there, see the vertical torque is at zero, and you're going to see this kick in pretty hard and pretty fast. Uh, and it's going to be caused mainly by this anterior posterior pushing horizontally on the ground. So as we get to the top, We're already creating 39.69, and what this is, Newton meters per kilogram, not percentage of body mass. So this vertical torque is the only one of these graphs that's in Newton meters per kilogram instead of percent of body mass. So he's at 39.69, which basically means his body is already rotating toward the target, and the club is just changing direction. This is a huge thing that I see with amateurs that they don't do very well. He actually is fairly low in this number. Uh, it averages around 52 Newton meters per kilogram for the tour set that I have on their data. So it's a pretty interesting um, thing to look at. And believe it or not, very easy to change. You can, make, you can do some drills with the golfer. Um, that can help them increase this. I think that's one of the reasons golfers are underturned on the downswing is they're never changing direction early enough with the ground before the club reaches the top. So the, the, the feet are going to continue on their AP until they max out. So right here, 
as the vertical torque is maxing out, it's caused by the, vert uh, by the anterior posterior force of the feet. The lead foot is pushing the hardest towards the ball, which creates a ground reaction force in the other direction, which is a negative one. And then the trail foot is pushing back behind the golfer, which is a positive ground reaction force. And that creates the most um, rotation. Now, obviously, we also know over here in the 3D, here's the force vectors of that golf swing. So it shows the feet, where they are on the force plates, where the force is coming from in the individual foot, its magnitude and its direction. So you have the trail foot, the lead foot, and the combined. So that's how it starts working on the golfer's center of mass to create rotation. So you could see from this view, they're going in the opposite direction. So that's what's really helping him rotate at this point in time. Now, what you're going to see is a very quick, even before impact, this anterior posterior force reverse for most really good golfers. So here he is at impact and his feet are doing the opposite. Obviously he's mostly off the ground, but what's there, most of these golfers have more vertical pressure on the ground at this point, but nonetheless, he's actually going in the opposite direction. See, so he's minus 10 here, and that's, he's working the ground to actually slow the pelvis down. It's one of the contributing factors. I wouldn't say it's the overwhelming factor. And then obviously his verticals, which we're going to talk about next, have already peaked. The verticals, which is the bottom graph, you know, when we're sitting here at address, the golfer is basically at zero. So the vertical force. And so you could say at address, which is well before the club starts back, in my opinion, you know, he's about 50-50. But as soon as the club starts back, he's 52% on his lead foot. You'll see the lead foot when the club starts back usually have more vertical force than the trail foot. Uh, that's because the lead foot is really taking control over the trail foot. The lead foot's going to push back more away from the target um, or towards the target, which pushes the golfer away while the trail foot's pushing the other way. So on the vertical, as the club goes back, he'll load more and more pressure into his right, his trail leg, which it pretty much peaks about right here. So he's 98% on his trail and only 7% on his lead. But at the top of the swing, that's not where he's going to be. But you notice that the trail, I mean, the lead leg actually has only 7.55% of his body mass in it. And that's kind of the left leg starting to flex. When the left leg flex, the majority of the pressure goes into the right trail leg because the lead leg is flexed, not because he translated to his trail side, you know, that he slid or swayed on his backswing. So here they start changing direction, and the pressure is going to slowly increase on the lead foot and decrease on the trail foot, and they're going to go to this point where he is at what we call maximum de-weighted. So if he was 100% at address, here we are just at the top of the swing, not much past, and he is de-weighted to only 71% of his body mass. So there's this de-weight in brown, that's his total, and then here comes the jump, which you're going to see the jump is predominantly going to be with the lead leg, not totally with the lead leg, but predominantly with the lead leg. So when we get to this, this de-weighting, again, 71% is right at the average of the 12 tour players I have in my database. You'll see amateurs not de-weight very much at all in the high 80s and low 90s. So you can't jump unless you de-weight. So I think this is a very important thing. Again, a very teachable, coachable thing to improve is to teach people to de-weight and then, and then use their verticals better. So here we are, he's de-weighted, and here comes the verticals, and here they're maxing out. 
So 136% of his body mass at maximum vertical force on his lead and 75% of his body mass with his trail, a total of 211% of his body weight. So he only weighs 160 pounds. So he's probably pushing in the ground 340% of his body mass at this moment in time. And then he jumps so hard that obviously as soon as he jumps, he's in the air. And when he gets to the ball, he doesn't have a whole lot. He has some on there, but it's it's not nearly as much as it was, uh, 211 to 88%. But you'd be surprised what's still left in those feet at this moment in time. So the timing of that also, you've got the time from the maximum D weight to the time of the maximum vertical is a very short period of time that's why you got this such steep slope here again the same thing with the vertical torque a high number in a steep slope going in the opposite direction these are very important things the laterals going from positive to negative in a very short period of time it's the it's these three doing their job totally that creates speed that as i say unloads the jackknife so this vertical pressure is pulling the grip normal which is uncocking this wrist uh, even more so the body's deceleration decelerating um, and the golfer is definitely pulling up and pulling the grip skyward which is helping uncock the club so there's a little bit of ABCs about how the dual force plates work we're very excited uh, to have teachers bring their students here to have them measured. Uh, we give an a honest, unbiased opinion of what we see, and the golfer and the golf professional can decide what's best and what they want to attack as far as using the ground. We use 3D at the same time with gears. Um, Taylor's got gears on, and obviously you see TrackMan. So we have those three technologies going on uh, in this particular lesson, and at least force plates and TrackMan in every lesson. So if you have any questions, uh, you can give me a call on my cell, 985-290-8507, or you can email me at lightsgolf at gmail.com. Thanks for your time.